Arguably, the RX 7000 series has been kind of a bust. The RX 7600 and 7700 series cards have been mostly outshone by their predecessors. The 7800 XT might be academically interesting, as it could be the basis of the GPU in the forthcoming PS5 Pro, and the 7900 GRE looks like great value, because it's a virtual rehash of the 6950 XT. Only the top two models in the series offer anything new in terms of raw performance, and as someone who recently came into possession of a 7900 XT and is upgrading from a 6900 XT, I thought it was worth seeing what the fuss was about. My Sapphire Pulse RX 7900 XT was kindly provided for review by Scan Computers, and for me, it represents a couple of important upgrades over what I had before. On my channel, I test mainly older CPUs and GPUs, and while my existing RX 6900 XT has been enough for testing even up to Zen 3 and Intel 8th and 9th gen CPUs without being too restrictive, upgrading to the 7900 XT opens up new possibilities. From a creative standpoint, RDNA 3 brings AV1 encoding and decoding. This is a far more efficient video codec compared to the H.265 I'm used to, allowing for smaller file sizes without compromising image quality. It's also far easier to work with in DaVinci Resolve, the program where I spend at least a couple of days a week churning out mini PC, um, I mean, uh, high quality gaming PC related content. If you're new to my channel and you're used to reviewers pairing high end GPUs with high end CPUs, I guess I'd probably have some explaining to do. My test platform of choice is what I call the moderately priced gaming PC. Uh, I usually make graphics card reviews from the perspective of gamers on a mid-range budget, so my test platform is one valued at around five to six hundred British pounds. The 2024 iteration of the MPG PC uses a Ryzen 5 7500F 6-core 12-thread Zen 4 CPU with 200MHz positive PBO and a negative 20 curve optimizer, which, if you don't speak AMD, means an automatic overclock by up to 200MHz and an automatic undervolt by a maximum of 20mV. The motherboard is a mid-range MSI B650, the RAM is 32 gigs of DDR5 6000 CL30 from Corsair, with sub-timings tuned according to BuildZoy's Easy Hynix timings, and the other specs are on screen. There is a chance that this CPU could hold back the GPU in high frame rate scenarios, so I'll be testing mainly in 1440p and 4K, and skipping FSR wherever possible. Oh, and because some people asked for it, and to satisfy my own curiosity, I've also included numbers from the RX 6900 XT for comparison. One of the more recent titles in my 2024 test suite is actually not all that demanding. Ghost of Tsushima is a cross-gen platform title, which means we should have plenty of room to crank both the quality and resolution. At 1440 very high, the numbers look pretty good as 106 FPS on average, with 1% lows of 93. In a broader context, however, it's not all that impressive. The RX 6900 XC scored 93 FPS, only 12% below the newer model and arguably not all that noticeable. At 4K, the new model looks a little more attractive, with an average just scraping below 60 FPS, whereas the RDNA 2 card only manages 50. Horizon Forbidden West is by a different developer and built on a different engine, but it was still made with PlayStations in mind, so it's not all that surprising that the results are very close to Ghost of Tsushima. However, both cards hold up a little better at 4K in this game, with the new card rarely dropping below 60 and the older card still clinging on to a 60-ish average. This makes the 6900 XT look like a pretty good option for a 4K card, especially given that it can be had for £400 or less these days, though I hear later stages of the game are a bit more demanding, so I think either way you should be prepared to kick in some FSR. Here's where things get a bit tougher. 
Hellblade 2 Senua's Saga has hyper-realistic visuals that stress even the best current-gen GPUs to their limits, and the 63 FPS from this card at 1440p is actually quite flattering, though it still dips below that from time to time. Meanwhile, the 6900 XT actually falls a little below the 50 mark, with 1% lows just under 40. Cranking up the resolution has a pretty serious impact, and if you're not okay with 30fps experiences, then either card is going to require upscaling. The 7900 XT remains almost 20% faster, and the 1% lows are still over 30, whereas the 6900 XT's frame rate drops dangerously close to cinematic. It's no secret that Alan Wake 2 doesn't play particularly well with Radeons when it comes to ray tracing. In standard rasterization, however, the RX 7900 XT can actually pull off a surprising level of performance without compromises. At 1440p, it saw 74 FPS, up from the 61 frames of its predecessor. Even 4K is sorta of playable, depending on how picky you are. I saw almost 40 FPS on average, which isn't acceptable in some types of game, but I think it's just about fine here. When it comes to RT, however, the Radeons don't stand a chance. The only semi-decent result I've had in this game with RT so far has been with the RTX 3080 Ti, and when I attempted to match settings on the 7900 XT, the AMD card fell almost 40% short of the older GeForce. Until Star Wars Outlaws comes out later this year, the position of Ubisoft's Snowdrop Engine game is filled by Avatar Frontier Elite 2. I'm generally pretty critical of this game, not just for having a name so generic I can say pretty much any combination of words for the subtitle and most people won't notice, but also because it doesn't allow RT to be selectively disabled. Thankfully, at this level, you don't really have to worry about it, because the 7900 XC is strong enough to brute force its way through. FSR is enabled by default, and with everything maxed out it manages a very acceptable 84 FPS. In fact, turning FSR off is actually still pretty playable, with the average only dropping to, um, 60 nerf. I think the only way I can recommend playing at 4K is by keeping FSR ultra quality and dropping the preset to high, which averages a fairly acceptable 61 FPS. As a title that originated on the PS5, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is another RT-enabled game that actually performs pretty well on Radeons, at least at 1440p. Without RT, the 7900 XT starts off strong at 120fps, while the 6900 XT still manages over 100 on average. With RT enabled, the newer card is a couple of frames short of the 60 mark, and it wouldn't take more than a couple of adjustments to the RT sliders, or maybe to resolution scaling, to reach a stable 60. The 6900 XT is going to need some more serious attention, or otherwise just lower standards. It can only manage 42 FPS with RT enabled. At 4K, RT really isn't an option with either card. Not impossible per se, but not recommended. Without RT, the cards can still hit 77 and 58 FPS respectively, both very playable experiences with little or no compromise needed. With RT on, however, the 7900 XT falls to just over 30 FPS, and the 6900 XT was initially a slideshow. A second attempt did see a cinematic 24 FPS, but the drops into the teens were pretty unacceptable. There are few things more satisfying to a modern PC gamer than going into the settings menu of Resident Evil 4 Remake, selecting the max preset, and not being hit with a memory warning. The RX 7900 XT can achieve this at 1440p, and only gives an amber warning at 4K. The former averages a whopping 129 FPS. Bear in mind that this is including ray tracing, though also consider that it's just used for reflections and, barring a couple of puddles, there's not much to reflect in this somewhat rural environment. The RX 6900 XT also performs remarkably well, only 12.5% below the 7900 at the same settings, and both cards can still deliver at 4K too. 
The new card averages 84 FPS with lows over 70, and the older model averages 71 with lows over 60. Though I did have to drop texture quality to 4 gigabytes on the 6900 XT to avoid getting a red warning. Once again, if you have 16 gigs or more VRAM on board, then you shouldn't ever have a problem running The Last of Us, and the 7900 XT runs like a dream at 1440p. The average FPS is pushing over the 100 mark, about 15% higher than its predecessor at the same resolution and settings. Pushing up to 4K takes a pretty serious toll on both cards, and even the 7900 XT might need some dropped settings or upscaling to maintain a constant 60. The RDNA 3 card averages 59 FPS at the Ultra preset, whereas the 6900 XT only manages 47, about 20% below its successor. I think it's pretty accurate to say that there's very little image quality difference between the Ultra and Extreme quality presets in Forza Horizon 5. And the in-game RT is so subtle, I have to look for the reflection of the wing mirrors to tell if it's even on. However, this game is so easy to run, and the 7900 XT is so far beyond what it was designed for, you might as well crank everything up just to make sure you don't wind up CPU limited. I would be quite happy with the 136 FPS that the 7900 XT can churn out at these settings, but if you're determined to hit 144, you could always drop RT to Ultra or add a bit of FSR. The 6900 XT is, of course, still performing incredibly, just 10% below the 7900 XT without needing to compromise on settings. At 4K, however, things do fall apart a bit. The 7900 XT drops below 100 FPS and its predecessor below 90, so naturally this is unplayable trash. Starfield is another game that might risk being CPU limited, not because of high frame rates, but because of bad design. I don't like using the term poorly optimised, because I'm not a developer, what do I know about optimization? but it strikes me that there shouldn't be anything about New Atlantis that's more demanding on the CPU than, say, the first Assassin's Creed, which also had a lot of NPCs roaming around at once, and that ran on a fucking Xbox 360. But I digress. The RX 7900 XT scores 72 FPS on average at 1440 Ultra with FSR disabled, which is only a 10% improvement over the older model, but does at least break the 66 FPS curse. At 4K, things look much the same when comparing the two cards, however, the average has now dropped below 50, so it might be time to consider leaving FSR turned on. Cyberpunk 2077 has some settings that will most likely remain off-limits on this GPU, just because path tracing is something Radeons don't handle well right now. Without RT enabled, both perform shockingly well. The 7900 XT can get close to a 100 FPS average, with 60 FPS lows caused by loading stutters that would probably be handled better on a higher-end CPU. The 6900 XT is only about 20% slower on average, which is a pretty big win for the new card, but also means you shouldn't write the older GPU off just yet. Somewhat amazingly, the 7900 XT can manage a mostly 60 plus experience at 4K Ultra, while the 6900 XT is going to require some compromises to hit that particular target. For RT testing, once again I tried matching settings with my RTX 3080 Ti review, and while both Radeons fall a long way short, the 7900 XT is still broadly playable, whereas the 6900 XT… not so much. My own take on the Radeon RX 7900 XT is going to be slightly skewed. This is the first time I recall ever having a graphics card I didn't pay for, so my value judgement can't help but be affected. If I were actually buying one brand new today at today's prices, then this card would cost about 30-40% to more than the 6900 XT or the similarly spec 6950 XT. 
The average frame rate gain over the previous models is about 20% at 1440p, so I'd have been paying about £100 for the extra performance and another £100 for the features RDNA 3 has that RDNA 2 lacks, like AV1 encoding. Would it have been worth it? To me, probably yes. I've had a chance to try AV1 files recently, and as someone who uses their PC for making videos, it promises to be a big time saver for me, but I appreciate not everyone has the same needs as I do. For 1440p gaming at very high and ultra settings, it's hard to recommend the 7900 XT over its predecessor, especially when the 6900 XT can be had for £400 or less on the used market. At 4K, it's a little different, as while the margin is still roughly 20%, that's the difference between around 60fps and around 50fps, and that could be the difference between an experience you enjoy and one you don't. Of course, you could just turn on FSR. Nobody has to know. I mean, you'll know. And I'll know. I always know. What I really appreciate is the extra performance in ray tracing. Not that the 7900 XT is some kind of RT monster, it still lags behind in Nvidia optimised titles, doesn't handle path tracing at all well, and there's no Radeon equivalent to ray reconstruction yet. But on the other hand, a true no compromise RT experience in games like Alan Wake 2 and Cyberpunk is still reserved for only the top end RTX cards, which cost two to three times as much. In a lot of console ports, it's possible for this card to run with RT enabled and maintain a near 60 experience, whereas the 6900 XT still needs FSR. Which brings me to my final point. AMD say they're working on integrating machine learning into the next generation of FSR upscaling, which, if done well, could close an important feature gap between RTX cards and Radeons. However, we don't yet know which GPUs will support it. It's nice to think that it will be available in every generation of AMD GPU, or at least every one based on RDNA, but if it uses the AI functionality of RDNA 3, that will probably mean the 6900 XT wouldn't have access to this next-gen upscaling. And that would be another pretty compelling point in favour of the RX 7900 XT. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.